Okay, good morning. How are you today? Now you see the weather we're used to here. This is now it will be like this the rest all this year and well into next year. So uh, be prepared. Okay, we we're in the middle of uh, chapter four. Uh, we have kind of reached the main point here, I think, in the sense that uh, we have. Uh, explained how we can find the mount curves for an individual consumer. We did this uh, in two ways, either through a kind of uh, graphical argument where we looked at how things changed when we changed the price of a certain good. And for each of these price changes we could solve a utility maximization problem and if you kind of uh, observe each price, each utility maximization then produced an optimal amount of this good. And this amount linked to the price produced the amount curve. It's kind of observing each of these points that produced the the amount curve. If you remember the, the graphical figure here, figure 4.1 in the textbook. And then of course Alternatively, we could kind of look at, uh, uh, a at a mathematical way of doing this, where we let uh, the price parameter be something that can vary when we perform the utility maximization. And then the only change, basically, is to remove the number and put in a PC here. And then we can find this link between the quantity of C here, in this case, the quantity of food demanded, and the price, sorry, the quantity of clothes demanded and the price of clothes PC. So, so this is kind of the main point here in chapter 4, how to uh, argue, how to find the, the demand curve for a certain good. And this is how it's done. And then there is some added points which we will start talking about today, which is referred to uh, as income and substitution effects. Uh, it says here that a fall in the price of a good has two effects. The first effect is that uh, the consumers will tend to buy more of the good that has become cheaper and less of the goods that are now relatively more expensive. Okay, if the price of a certain good goes down if the price of a certain coffee product goes down of course you will buy more of that coffee and less of other coffee products given that the prices of those are kept fixed this is referred to as the substitution effect okay substitution means interchanging so you buy more of one good less of another or other goods that's referred to as a substitution effect we substitute more of one product and less of other products. But, and that's important here, because one of the goods now is now cheaper, consumers enjoy an implicit increase in income. Now if you kind of look at an image of an economy and you reduce the price on one good, then of course the average price in the economy goes down, doesn't it? Because one product gets cheaper, the others are kept constant, then there is an implicit income increase then for the consumers, isn't it? And that is what we refer to as the so-called income effect. So we can kind of think of the total effect here. Uh, of a price decrease on a certain product as kind of decomposed into two different effects, the substitution effect and the income effect. And uh, we can make a graph describing intuitively how this decomposition is. And that's what's done here in figure 4.6 in the textbook. Uh, let's just read the text here. A decrease in the price of food. Now food is along this axis. And we start out with a certain budget constraint, the solid blue line here moving from R to S. Okay, that's the starting point. 
then there is a price decrease. And as we argued yesterday, what happens then is that this budget constraint rotates out like this. Okay? Price goes down, rotating out. So this is basically what we have learned so far. And of course we can draw an indifference curve here, the red curve, and don't look at these yet. Okay, and then you get an optimal utility maximization point here for the consumer, which is named A. Okay, and of course based on A you can find the amount of food demanded as well as the amount of clothes demanded, clothes demanded. This is kind of just a repetition of what we did yesterday. Now we can kind of look at this deco decomposition by drawing a new budget line, okay, which should be parallel to the new budget line. <coughs> so the new budget line is kind of dotted here, and we have also drawn a parallel to that one, which is not dotted uh, here, uh, written in a slightly lighter blue color. And we draw this parallel budget line in such a way that it hits another point on the indifference curve which is already put tan tangent to this budget constraint. <coughs> the outer dotted line here can of course be the, uh, be the, the outcome of a new utility maximization problem. We draw a new in this case dotted indifference curve to find the new point of, uh, of optimize or the, the new point for the optimal solution. Of course again we can can read out the F2 which is the new amount of food uh, which is uh, demanded and of course it increases in this case moving from F1 all the way up to F2 due to the fact that it's, uh, it's a price decrease. But the point here is that is the point defines the so-called income effect here. We kind of have an implicit decrease in the income. The budget constraint is parallelized down. That corresponds to an income decrease, doesn't it? If it goes up, it's an income increase. So this, this is less income for the consumer. And this point here defines the so-called uh, income effect, as it says here. So we can kind of think of the transformation from this A point into this B point by, by, by two steps. First here, we move down to the D point, then we substitute, then we kind of buy more of the cheaper product, food, and less of the relatively more expensive uh, uh, good clothes. And then we kind of move from D up to B, producing uh, another effect. So the fact that they have relatively more income also leads to, in this case, that they buy more of this, uh, this good food. So in this case, both the substitution effect and the income effect is positive. This can, of course, also be done mathematically, but then we have to um, apply some equations referred to as the Slutsky equations, which are kind of complicated, so I don't think we spend time on that. So what you kind of need to, to grasp here is that this is a kind of convenient way to describe the transformation from a certain optimal point A to another optimal point B, and we could do it kind of by sidestepping into this D point. And then we get two parts all kind of what's happening. And this is kind of logical, isn't it? If the consumers are kind of exposed to a market where one of the prices goes down, then of course they start buying more of that product and less of oh, oh competing products, so to speak. But at the same time, as one price goes down, the kind of average prices goes down, it gets they, they get relatively more rich in a sense. And of course that will also lead to buying more of these products as well as typically other products. So this is uh, the concept of uh, substitution and income effects. The nice thing about this is that we can kind of look at different situations now where perhaps either substitution or especially income effects may not be positive. Okay, so let's look at 
another example here. Here we look at the negative income effect, a so-called inferior good. Of course, these, to kind of get these effects, you kind of need to manipulate with the, with the indifference curves and the budget constraints in a way that you kind of achieve it. If you look, you look at the situation here, you see that we, we have a similar type of situation. We move from an A point to a B point. But in this situation, the actual change from A to B is quite small. Okay? The total effect here is, is going from A to B, so it's, it's quite a small effect. Uh, but you see here, uh, doing the same, um <coughs> during this one, during this one, taking it down, we get a point down here for this D. And to be able to go from D to B, of course, we have to move back, don't we? So we, there must be a negative income effect in this case. The substitution effect here is quite large. It's moved from F1 up to E. But you see here that to go back to D, we have to go back to this line, so we need a negative income effect. If you look at the text here, it says that the consumer is initially at A on budget line, RS uh, with a decrease in price of food. The consumer mo then moves to B. The resulting change in food purchased can be broken down into the substitution effect, F1E, which is can be read directly from the graph, associated with the move from A to D. <coughs> and an income effect, EF2, associated with the move from D to B. In this case, food is an inferior good because the income effect is negative. So we, we can kind of demonstrate uh, directly graphical the meaning of this concept of inferior good, which we talked about yesterday, didn't we? We talked about this inferior good, and we talked about this angle curve. You remember these rented flats, okay? When people got richer, they kind of bought less of it. And that is the exact the situation you get here, a negative income effect. The angle curve kind of flips in the other direction. Okay, now let's look at a different type of effect, so-called given good. Now recall that an inferior good is a good you buy less of when you get more income. Okay? But let's look at the at this case, what's happening here. Of course we can think of a situation where this negative income effect is larger than the substitution effect. That's possible, isn't it? Recall back here, we had a positive substitution effect, negative income effect, and the net effect is positive here. It's a moving in that direction. But if, if this one is bigger, it's moving all the way out down here, we can end up in a situation where the total effect is negative. And that means that if the price goes down on a certain product, now it's the price, not the income, then you buy less of it. Sorry, you buy uh, less of it, yeah, that's the point. Price goes down, you buy less of it. That's what's called uh, a given good. <coughs> we talked about situations where the demand curve is upward sloping, didn't we? That, that's possible cases. You want to buy more of a certain product if, or less of a certain product if the price goes down. Or opposite, if the price goes up, you buy more of the same product. We talked about luxury goods, okay? We, we, we gave you this explanation. It's Prada bags or whatever could have that effect, okay? But uh, this is not exactly the situation we look at here. There is some discussion in among the theorists guy here on whether you actually have two different type of these type of effects. One you could call a luxury type of effect, and it's often referred to as a Veblen good. Uh, the classical example here is perhaps um, the hunger in Ireland in the, in the early mid 1850s in those days they kind of ate both basically only potatoes and herring you know what herring is it's uh, a fish in a region called sil it's a kind of small fish it was a lot of it in Norway in the old days probably also in Ireland and they kind of had to to base their food on on potatoes and herring and you can perhaps think that the amount of energy is bigger in potatoes than in herring. 
and if the price on potatoes then rise you basically cannot afford to eat anything but potatoes so you have to stop eating herring and start eating more potatoes to kind of get the enough amount of, of energy which, which you need to kind of live and, and this is kind of the classical given explanation and there are kind of two again kind of poor people they have to to uh, to uh, to survive and then in order to do that you have to when the price of potatoes increase you you you, you kind of come to the conclusion that I can't eat uh, any more herring I, of course it's boring to eat only potatoes but to survive you have to stick to potatoes only and then you kind of make capital available by stop buying herring and then you use that capital to buy potatoes alone so then you get this effect don't you price of potatoes increase and you have to stop eating herring take the money and buy more potatoes okay to to keep alive so the nice thing about this decomposition structure is that you can kind of visually show the effect of different situations and uh, these are kind of the we have the normal situation here where you get the both a positive and a posit positive substitution as well as a positive income effect. Then you have this mid situation with an inferior good where you have a positive substitution effect, a negative income effect, but still a pos positive total effect. And then the kind of extreme case where you have a, a positive substitution effect, you will typically always have a positive substitution effect. And then a large negative income effect, which, which is so large that the total effect becomes negative. Okay, enough about these effects. I'll just wash my hands. You can think of any questions, if you have. We talked yesterday about uh, kind of the comparing the general theory into different markets, I think, like normal manufacturing markets, or should we say entertainment markets? That's more interesting for us. And we kind of pointed out that uh, on the production side, this is kind of interesting. But uh, of course, it's also interesting on the demand side. If uh, if uh, event producer uh, or produces events, uh, and we discussed that it could be different markets producing the revenue of course it means that there are different groups of demanders here okay uh, a football team gets demand from their spectators who move to the pit but there is also demand from the tv viewers locally regionally even globally for the big teams and of course there's demand from sponsors so there's at least three different groups of demanders which are facing a normal event producer. Even if you look at the theaters or concerts, you have the same kind of structure, don't you? There's those who are in the concert hall, potential TV viewers, as well as potential sponsors. Of course, normally to a lesser extent than in the case of sports markets, but the structure is kind of similar. Okay, let's move on. Now, we have talked about a single consumer. Okay, how to find the demand curve for a single consumer. Of course, most markets contain more than a single co consumer. I, I, in our case, it should be as many as possible, basically, if you want to achieve perfectly competitive markets. And we need some kind of notion on how to kind of put together individual demand curves and uh, this is the concept of, of aggregation here we kind of add together uh, demand curves uh, here we have a table table 4 2 and then we have kind of done our job here specifying utility functions for 
individual A, individual B, individual C, and for each of these individuals we have done this work, we have performed utility ma maximization repeatedly for different choices of price, and then of course we kind of can find demand curves for each of these individuals, can't we? That's, that's just repeating what we have done previously for different individuals and different preference structures. Of course, these individuals will typically also have different budget constraints. But the point is that the output of that process would be demand curves, one for each individual. And that's kind of what's represented in the four, four first columns in table 4.2. So for these prices, one, two, three, four, and five, this individual A, he, he demands six for the price of one and four for the price of two. Uh, the, the individual B is 10 for the price of one and two for the price of five and so on. And of course the total demand that would hit a producer and is simply contained by just adding together these demands, isn't it? But again you must observe here that we make a grave assumption here, okay? These individuals here, they are not allowed to kind of make contracts in between them, okay? Because they could go together and say, okay, we, 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 we join into a group and we face the producer instead of doing it individually. And this is again this assumption of of, uh, of uh, in, a, in a sense, we need an infinite number of consumers to, to make this assumption valid. Because if there is a, a limited amount of consumers, then there's always a possibility of coalition building. But if we assume that that's not possible here, either by saying that the, this table is in infinitely large, or there are other reasons why they are not able to, to act strategically in this buying process, then obviously, the total demand is constructed by just adding along these lines here, isn't it? So if the price is 1 here, individual A, he demands 6, individual B demands 10, individual C demands 16, of course we just add 6 plus 10 plus 16 together, it produces a demand of total demand in the market, in this case containing 3 individuals, uh, to be 32. Similarly in the second line, if the price is 2, then there is 4 demanded from individual A, 8 for indivi individual B and 13 from individual C and 13 plus 8 plus 4 is 25. <coughs> Similarly for the uh, three remaining prices. And of course graphically you can think of this as shown in the figure down right here where you kind of draw this. It turns out that these demand curves are linear uh, at least for this part here, this part here, and this part here. Do you know how you, you can see easily whether these numbered curves are linear? The easy way to see that is just to subtract, isn't it? 6 minus 4 is 2, 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 minus 0 is 2, 10 minus 8 is 2, 8 minus 6 is 2. So you have a constant difference. That means you have a constant derivative, and if you have a constant derivative, you have a linear curve. So you get these linear curves here, you see the two first ones are parallel, because the difference is the same, 6 minus 4 is 2, 10 minus 8 is 2, while in this case there is a different difference, isn't it? 16, 16 minus 13 is 3, 13 minus 10 is 3. So it's slightly less steep, this C consumer. So you have three different st uh, straight lines here, and you just add them together like this. You just add these points together to get the market demand curve. And of course implicitly this is much larger than in this example. As it says down here, the market demand curve is obtained by summing over three consumers' demand curves, DA, DB and DC. At each price, the quantity of coffee, it's in this case it's coffee, okay, demanded by the market, is the sum of the quantities demanded by each consumer at the price of $4, for example. The quantity demanded by the market, 11 units, <coughs> is the sum of the quantities demanded by A, uh, no units, B, 4 units, and C, 7 units. So they down here they are looking at adding together this line to produce 11. Okay, so at this point we have kind of argued how to find a market demand curve, okay? A market is uh, made up of many customers, uh, hopefully as many as possible, 
each of them produce an individual demand curve. Each of these demand curves can be added together to produce a market demand curve. So this uh, kind of ends this slightly long story, uh, uh, where we I kind of showed you the kind of background for getting or stating that we can have demand curves. But as you see, there is some assumptions which is needed here. And the main assumptions, main basic assumption to kind of avoid avoid these strategic effects is that uh, these consumers here they don't kind of interact in any way. That is, of course, not necessarily a sensible assumption. Especially if you look at sport markets, if you think about football clubs demanding football players, then perhaps you can look at Premier League, and Premier League is not that big. Is it? Even though it's 20 clubs, they kind of know each other, they can communicate, they can say, OK, this year we won't buy any players from France, we only buy players from Germany. Uh, of course, they can do that. It's perhaps not necessarily in the best interest, but that's an option they have, actually. And that makes these underlying assumptions of the perfect competitive equilibrium uh, perhaps not that valid in the markets that interest, interests us most. But still, as I said previously, understanding uh, the basics here is important to potentially move to another way of analyzing these markets. OK. Uh, finally here, uh, oh is it finally? No, it's not really finally. Almost finally. Uh, there is something called consumer surplus. Now if you think about a market, okay, there is a one price in the market, isn't it, normally? Okay, there is um, a demand curve and a supply curve and in the intersection we get a price don't we of course we also get a quantity but uh, let's uh, focus on the market price now okay so if you just take this figure and look only at the demand curve and look at the market price we can kind of draw this type of figure which kind of looks like the figure on the overhead here. In that case, the market price is 14, actually. You can just say that. Market price. And this is the amount uh, 6.5, which is kind of. Uh, kind of sold in this market. This amount is, of course, found by looking at the supply curve, which we haven't put in here, OK? These are actually rock concert tickets, it seems. So this seems nice for us, interested in that kind of stuff. <coughs> now, what kind of value ex uh, generation do we get here? How much money does this market produce? Now, this market sells 6.5 units at a price of 14, doesn't it? So the kind of total, it's called, referred to as actual expenditure here. This is kind of the money which is spent in the market, isn't it? The suppliers here, they put 6.5 units into the market, and it's sold at a market price of 14, meaning that 14 times 6.5 is the total market expenditure or if you like the amount of money spent in this market okay and you, you can see it corresponds to this area here doesn't it you find the area of a rectangle by taking one side and multiply it by the other side so we can look at it as an area The area on top here is referred to as consumer surplus in the figure. And what does that mean? Now it means here that the consumers on top of this line here, they are willing to pay more than the market price. Okay, that's the idea of this demand curve, isn't it? If you kind of think of this point as a singular consumer, he is actually willing to pay 
for the product, but he, he is happy, okay? You just have to buy 14. So this is a surplus or a profit for the consumers up here, isn't it? All this area here constitutes the total surplus or profit or happiness or whatever you like to call it. I yes, Kelly? So I say in the real world uh, events, say I have, an, I have a show and a uh, ticket it's for say 100 now. And uh, if I decide to sell maybe some VIP ticket for 500 now, would that still be under consumer surplus? Because no, the price is twice. it wouldn't. Because then you, you, you refrain from the assumption here that there's a single market price. What you are doing then is called price discrimination, isn't it? You, you, you try to capture more of this consumer surplus. Your idea is to get this happy consumer money and put it down here, isn't it? Of course you can do that. Yeah, the extreme way of doing that would be to use an auction mechanism, wouldn't it? You start with the first ticket, okay? And every consumer is available. How much would you like to buy, buy it for, okay? Given that these consumers can't communicate and uh, so on, uh, you, you, you can hope for getting perhaps not the total willingness to pay, but at least something close to it, okay? Actually, you could hope for getting the second best willingness to pay. I think about an auction, okay? Um, let's assume, you know what an auction is, don't you? Sure. Yeah, okay. So let's assume that we have some object and we have some bidders, okay? What the bidders in an auction do is, of course, that they bid, okay? So let's assume we have these possible bids down here, but they also have some willingness to pay. We, we refer often to that as the a reserve price in an auction, okay? So we assume that each, each of these bidders, they have a maximum amount they are willing to pay for this object. It could be a ticket for something, okay? And what happens, of course, is that when we start this auction, is that people start to bid, okay? And the price is going up here, and at certain points, these bidders with low reserve prices are kind of jumping out, because the price is exceeding their willingness to pay. But then we come up here, okay? Suddenly we move on top of this R2. So now we have a bid, which is uh, a little bit higher than R2. What happens then? What happens is, of course, that the auction stops, doesn't it? Because it must be this guy who has put in this bid. And being greedy, of course, he doesn't want to pay more. So the auction stops, and you kind of end up with the price, uh, the final bid, equal to, uh, should we say, R2 plus some epsilon, some, some little more. Okay. So you see that an auction mechanism could at best get the second highest <coughs> reserve price, so to speak. Of course, given that the bidders are greedy, or unless you try to construct another bidding mechanism than, than this classical open English auction mechanism. The other ways of having auctions, you can have closed auctions, for instance, writing down on a letter, putting it in an envelope. You could have all kinds of stuff here. Uh, the nice thing about this auction is that it's so-called truth-telling, but uh, now I'm moving in many directions here. But your, your original question is, of course, that you can do it a li little bit simpler than this. You can say, okay, we have VIP tickets, we have uh, tickets for those over 80 years old, we have tickets for those under 15 years old, we have tickets on the balcony, we have tickets on the floor, and so on. Okay, and you can have different prices on this, trying to capture more of these consumer surplus. But the point here is much more simple than that, okay? We need to kind of understand that there is a consumer surplus in any cases. And the easiest way to look at it is in this situation where we have a single market price, then it's very easy to identify the consumer surplus because it would be easy to calculate here, wouldn't it? The total area here is a triangle, so you can just take this line here, which is 6.5. You can multiply it with the height here which is perhaps, um, let's say it's 20 then, minus 14, which is uh, 6, isn't it? And just divide it by 2 to get the area of the triangle. Of course, if it's a full rectangle, it's half of it to get the area of a triangle. 
So uh, the simple point here is to say, okay, there must be something called a consumer surplus. Kelly, he knows a lot about this, so he is making it difficult for us. He wants to introduce different prices. Then, of course, you get different parts uh, into this situation. Basically, what you do when you do price discrimination is something you will learn in a later course. Okay, we are just making introductory here. But price discrimination is, of course, very important in event, sports, entertainment markets. It's used all the time. We'll also talk in another course, for some of you, on dynamic pricing, how to use time to be able to capture more or willingness to pay. Yeah, look at pre-sales. How should you do that? In many cases, we see very crazy pre-sales, don't we? What is the point of pre-selling tickets to the World Cup final in football? At a relatively low price. The only effect is, of course, to create a black market, isn't it? <laughs> That's not nice. Okay, you you, you you would like to have that income. Okay, so there is some stuff here which obviously is not easy to handle because we see reality uh, that there uh, that there is problems. But so far, so simple. Okay, consumer surplus on top of the market price under the demand curve. That area we define as consumer surplus and the meaning is of course that all consumers up there they are paying too little for the product compared to their willingness to pay for it. Of course if you're greedy like Kelly then you would like to capture some of this being the uh, event producer as I tend to call it uh, or the arranger or what you would like to name it. But that is not the topic for this course. A half times 20 minus 14, which is 6. But then they have to multiply it by 6,500. Why do you do that, do, do you think? Maybe it has uh, any good suggestions for these 6,500 here? Yeah, it's in thousand, but that should be one thousand, shouldn't it? Is it? Uh, it's price dollars per ticket here, okay? And then it's in thousands here, so I would multiply with a thousand here, not uh, six thousand five hundred. Maybe it's a typo. You see? Of course, I did only this calculation, which is a half times. Oh, let's see. It's something here. Ah, ah, of course. You just multiply these by a thousand, then you get six thousand five hundred. Oh, I'm silly. That was correct. Okay. You just have to see that rock concert tickets is, is measured in thousands here. So six point five is not six point five tickets. It's actually six thousand five hundred tickets. As simple as that. <coughs> okay. Finally, in chapter 4, uh, there is a little bit here on so-called network externalities. Now, we have assumed here that people's demands for goods are independent of one another. So there is kind of no link here between these consumers' demand. Okay, we, we have kind of stressed this, haven't we? But we, we probably know that there are certain products where this link is obvious. A classical example is Facebook and Twitter and this kind of stuff, isn't it? My willingness to pay for Facebook depends on the number of other people who use Facebook, doesn't it? If I want to use a cell phone, I need people to call or send a message, SMSs to, and if there is no people, then it really doesn't have much value, does it? So the value depends on the number of consumers. To some extent, we can say that sports, for instance, uh, sp the sport product is, is the opposite way. The value depends on other com competitors. Okay, you need two teams to play to play a match. You need a certain amount of cross-country skiers to get an interesting race. Okay, but this is on the demand side, and there are certain products who 
who has uh, has these abilities and you can see the network meaning here if there is network ex externalities it means that the value for an individual consumer or product depends on typically how many other consumers that choose to consume this product the classical example of course all this social media stuff it says FB there that probably that means Facebook it's Microsoft Word meaning that some say that Microsoft Word is not a good product but the value of Microsoft product is that so many people use it and then you can import their documents, you can export your documents and so on. It's the same kind of argument. <coughs> Those situations are such that one person's demand should be depends, I think, not depends on other person's demands. So what about in the Entertainment, sport, event side, do we see any network externa externalities there on the demand side? You do, don't we? If you go to a football match, it's nicer if there's more people. Or maybe not. Maybe it's the other way around. It's worse if it's a lot of people because then there's queues. Hard to get uh, coffee or sausages. Impossible to get into toilets and so on. So <laughs> it could be in both ways, couldn't it? So they, they could actually have both a positive and a negative network effect when it comes to the demanders. But mostly we tend to assume that demanders prefer events with many people in them. It could of course be that the demanders don't understand what they are looking at. There is uh, some kind of modern music or modern art. And if they see there's a lot of people there, then they get the feeling that, ah, this must be interesting. I must go here too see what it is, but due to the simple fact that there's a lot of people there. You see what I mean? A kind of demand snob effect. Okay. Because a lot of people in Molde go to see the local football team play, then I must go as well. Perhaps not because I'm interested in football, but if I need to learn to know these people, or if I need to talk to them about some other stuff, maybe I can meet them there. Now you have seen Molde, haven't you? There's not much people out here in the evenings. In the center it's nobody, is it? But if 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 on certain Sundays or Saturdays around six o'clock you go down to the city you see that's a crowded with people. Obviously, this is relevant. If if these people can be of interest to you, you must go there and meet them. Okay. Even though you're not so you see these network externalities could be in very important and of course in our world where all this social media stuff is running around the the value for any customer depends definitely on the number of other customers using this service okay it's time for a break do you want to have a question Kelly? Uh, I don't get the idea of snob food no me neither <laughs> <laughs> So let's stick to the examples I've discussed. It's probably I had some idea at that point, but I've forgotten it. Maybe I, I can get it. Very good question, by the way. Okay. Let's take a break. 15 minutes. Yeah, I think the effect might be that if a very rich person, which is very well known, uses a certain watch, then that watch may be more valuable for you. You see? Okay, that's the snob. You can see a snob effect as some kind of network uh, effect as well. <laughs>